Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Fotografiska, the Contemporary Museum of Photography, Art and Culture. Tonight, we'll have opportunity to hear the conversation, unleash your imagination, journey into unknown, between Juliana Huxtable and uh, Monilola Olayemi Ilupeju, two artists, and it's a great pleasure to have them both, both on the stage. They're going to discuss the Huxtable's new body of work, an exhibition, Usifilia, which is one of our three inaugural exhibitions at the museum. Uh, please allow me to briefly introduce our speakers. Texas-born and New York-based artist, writer, musician, and performer, Juliana Huxtable excels in probing dormant imaginalized histories, narratives, and technologies to challenge discourses around contemporary perceptions of identity, futurity, and politics. Through painting, photography, text, and video, she has defined a singular aesthetics of language that often plays into a digital, tumbleized visual identity, a kind of collage rap and visual rapture. Huxtable's pra practice offers a key critical voice on identity and comments of different forms of reality through the lens of her personal structural experience. Inseparable from the political, the personal is our opportunity for disobedience, and Huxtable plays with this concept through her ever-evolving portrait of selfhood. Her works and performances have been presented internationally in solo and group exhibitions, including Brooklyn Museum New York, MoMA PS1, and Whitney Museum of American Art New York. Monilola Olayemi Ilupeju is a 26-year-old Nigerian-American artist and author based in Berlin. She graduated with distinction from New York University, where she studied studio art and social and cultural analysis. She's also an alumna of the Skauhagen School of Painting and Sculpture. Through painting, installation, moving image, writing, and performance, her practice confronts the insidious and generative qualities of distortion that are projected onto bodies. As she works through intimate subject matter, she also interrogates the broader political context from which these issues arise. She has done extensive curatorial editorial work with savvy contemporary and archive books, among others. Ilupeju also participated in numerous group exhibitions. She also had several solo ones. The next one is in Vienna, right? Solo show in Tart Vienna, curated by Miriam Bettina. Uh, please welcome Juliana and Manilola. Thank you so much for the introduction and the invitation. And it's such a, an honor uh, to be able to have this conversation with you today. Very surreal. Um, so the first question that I have has to do with the title of the exhibition. When I first heard of it, I immediately thought of Andrea Longchu's uh, debut book, Females, and her very controversial claim that it describes femaleness as uh, a kind of existential condition in which you are subject to the whims of others, the whims and the desires of others. It's a kind of self-hollowing, um, a self-sacrificing that happens that all genders are, um, so are forced to undergo. And it, it is this estrangement from this reality that creates things like gender and politics. Um, and then in terms of the, the title of the show, Ossiophilia, am I pronouncing it right? Okay. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a suffix that essentially turn, can turn anything into a pussy. Um, a tree becomes a trussy, uh, a speaker becomes a spussy. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm just, I'm kind of curious to know like what your origin story is with this word um, and why you chose it for the title of your exhibition. Um, so I was already, as a writer and someone that's really interested in the way that language just evolves on a kind of street level. So one of the things I love about um, queer culture in general, um, one of the things I love about New York especially, um, and also New York as like a sort of like nexus point of queer culture, um, is that there's a really rapid 
kind of hyperspeed evolution of language. And so um, there's a kind of like repurposing, remixing, like um, that happens kind of live in front of you. And so some of that happens in relationship to music, some of that happens in relationship to, to kind of like uh, popular media events are kind of um, uh, even, even kind of like political or sort of events in the news that really capture the attention or imagination of the general public. And so I love language play um, and it's really important to me. And I also love language play as a way to be quite specific and to take um, concepts and events and ideas and like um, deploy them in a way that can be used um, uh, for different purposes, for specific communities, whatever, whatever. Um, and so with the introduction of the era of the OSI, um, I was really, really, really happy. And the second I sort of was open to the concept, I think it was probably, um, I think Thrussy was probably the first OSI that I encountered, which is just the earth, it's like the throat. Um, and so it's like, oh, you can give someone good thrussy, or I give good thrussy, and there's thrussy, bussy, tussy, whatever, uh, non binary like it could sort of just go on endlessly. Um, and what I love about it is, besides just the obvious like fun of being able to ossify things, is the, uh, I, I, I feel like it's a mirror to a kind of cultural moment that's really interesting to me. And so I think we're in the era of um, at least, a lot of this is performative. I think the actual distribution of economic and political resources is maybe changing ever so slightly at best, but there's a kind of like performative, like nobody wants to be a cis head white, person with money, no, no. <laughs> so there's this kind of like cultural running away from the performance or the embodiment of power, which is so interesting, especially as someone who grew up um, with the media of the 90s when it was like the opposite was so true. And so I feel like the ossification of language goes is a kind of reflection of a cultural moment that maybe also relates to that essay that Andrea, um, that Andrea wrote about it's 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 a sort of like the if 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 you can make a sort of parallel then the making of an orifice out of something that you know some of it is an orifice a mouth is already an orifice a, a, a throat is like a tunnel so there's already kind of like direct comparisons but I love to ossify things that don't necessarily like logically make sense as an orifice or one that. Um, at least serves a sexual purpose. And so it's from that idea, just sort of a fascination with that. And also there's like, I don't know, I don't, it's like a, there's like a, a kind of academic, quasi-academic body. I think it's like the American Dialect Society or something. There's basically, there's an American society that sort of like um, oversees the introduction of new language into like the dictionary, um, like how, like when do we take something from kind of like popular slang vernacular and push it into something that's being officially recognized. And so the word of the year for 2022 was the, was, was Usi and they described it as like Usification. And they sort of wrote, um, they sort of wrote a description um, of what that means. And I just, I, I thought it was so fun that they were having so much fun. I was like, wow, Ima the American Dialect that, Society is really cool. Imagine them like sitting together, like deciding the exact definition of the word. I wonder what that meeting was like. Yeah. Um, and I felt I already kind of identified with it. And so what it does in language is also, I think, part of what I am trying to do, at least um, with some of the interspecies work that I've been doing, which is to find a sense of joy and play in the kind of like dissection or opening up of ways that people approach bodies, ways that people approach kind of even questions of like style. Um, and so I felt like it was a really good entryway into a kind of like larger view of the body of work that I've made recently and also the new work that I'm making now. Um, I think there's like a sense of play um, in ossification, but the structure of ossifying things I really relate to. And also I feel like there's so much mythology in your work and I do think that language in it in itself is this kind of collective myth-making also, you know, like language is 
um, it's something that we, I think, take for granted and it's constantly changing. And, and I think also it's very, um, yeah, it's just very malleable. And I find that sometimes language is changing um, faster than we are actually. Like in, in a way, I feel like society would be in a much more um, healthy place if it could catch up to where language is today. Um, but yeah, I'm curious to know more about just your relationship to mythology and also how these interspecies avatars kind of came to be. And I'm also curious to know about your uh, relationship to auto-representation, self-portraiture. For me personally, as an artist working a lot with self-portraits, I, I find myself having very complex feelings about it uh, as I continue. Um, it's, so I'm always really happy when I see other artists leaning into um, that, because I feel like there's a lot of pressure to actually move away from um, self-portraiture that I also feel like is maybe quite, um, like, I feel like there's like some like anti-racist and anti-like femme uh, things that, that that are a part of this feeling of, oh, I shouldn't be like turning to myself and like mining from my own, my own self. But yeah, I hope I, there's a couple of questions in that, but I'll just, I'll give it to you. Um, I mean, I think the question, I think there's like maybe at least amongst like, art critical sectors and our artists who try to be in tune with like what's going on and have a kind of like critically aware relationship to it. There's maybe a move away from figuration in general, particularly figuration that like it rests on the representation of someone's bodies as something that's inherently virtuous. Like I think there was maybe uh, an assumption and or a kind of like market desire amongst um, at least like visual art that um, the representation of an othered body or the representation of a body that's not othered but aware of its own criticality and the representation of the thing, that that was somehow virtuous by virtue of the fact that it did that. I think we're clearly now at a point where um, which coincides with the kind of backlash against identity politics that's occurred on a, on a public like level, both from within people that have historically benefited from and or advanced that discourse, but also from people that are maybe coming from a more uh, conservative kind of like fake universal and or like, like nationalist perspective. But I think all of those reasons combined, there's a reticence around a lot of artists to engage with, especially something like self-portraiture, because okay. there is a framework that I think a lot of people come to where it's like, you're representing yourself and your people and your nationality and your gender, and it's exhausting, and that can be really exhausting as an artist to have to engage in that way. But for me, um, I've, I've never come at it as an attempt to signal a virtue. I've never come at it as an, as an attempt to signal a kind of cohesive political ideology or something. And so I, it's also important for me to find uh, play and joy and experimentation. And yes, also I'm thinking about a lot of other questions, but I think part of the reason why I'm attracted to the kind of intersection of the human and the non-human, even just as a kind of like uh, conceptual space that you enter, is that it sidesteps, um, or at least I hope that it sidesteps, the kind of overwrought nature of the uh, frameworks that people engage um, portraiture and especially um, self-portraiture. Um, and so, yeah. I think also like, so I had the, I, I was able to see the, the installation in progress and I was met with the works from the Akimbo Spittal series for the first time uh, in, in the flesh. And it's so interesting to see the way that the analog application of paint meets the, the photographic print. Because honestly, online, it, it feels very digital in this way. And I know that you also do digital manipulation. But the thought that I had was maybe you are, like, also just by being able to kind of up, upskate certain areas of the print with these other characters, it does create this space, the spaciousness almost between you and the viewer, which I thought was like a very smart, um, like way to kind of deal with the, the pressure of um, being a, being an artist who's constantly, you know, yeah, like your, your body's on display in certain ways. So I thought it was a very interesting and smart, like um, formal 
solution almost to that. Um, yeah, I, I'm also so curious to know about uh, just, I know that the video is still in progress, but in the installation, uh, it's your biggest European solo, like solo exhibition to date. Congratulations, it's a big deal. You should all come back for the opening on the, on the 14th I'm to see it. That. Get, your, get your tickets or find someone to sneak you in. Um, but I'm so curious to know about this music video a little bit and also your new band, Tongue in the Mind. I, I've had the pleasure of seeing little teasers on Instagram of some of your performances. And yeah, like what's going on? Um, I think that maybe like to address both of the things that you're saying, there's like a relationship between both of them in the sense that, so oftentimes where my work is moving into or where my interests move into is a response to like, I think some people are like, even with the self-portraiture, it's like for me, if self-portraiture isn't working, I'm just gonna move on to something else. Um, and also like uh, a lot of the works on Thursday. So there's, there's one large piece that is like me, that is one self-portrait. Um, but then this is actually the first show that I have also incorporated shooting a lot of my friends. And so three of my friends, Dylan, one of them is here today. Um, who's also in the band, Tongue in the Mind, are also incorporated in the work because I felt an immense pressure. I'm sort of back and forth with the self-portraiture. Sometimes I'm just like, I know how to give what it needs to give. And so it's sometimes it's like, well, who else is going to embody the, the ethereal arthropod? I can do that. I don't know how to direct someone to do that sometimes. And so it's, there's a frustration that can come from that. And so sometimes just out of practicality, but then there is an immense pressure and I'm aware of the frameworks that people approach um, uh, like kind of like representational art with. And so there's really been a joy working on this show in particular to shoot and work with friends. And so there's this kind of interactive process that happens where I'm like, it, it's sort of been like, it's almost like um, I think of myself as like, oh, it's like art painting therapy where it's like, okay, if you could be any sort of animal, what would you be? Which, um, and then they like sort of give a list and I'm like, okay, I would rather go a reptile direction than like mammal, like I've done like mammalian quadrupeds. So like if we could switch it up and then we will kind of work together to come up with a representation of them. And so I think even just that is a response to what I do feel an immense pressure um, when I represent myself and also just like, it's a lot to con to look at yourself constantly and edit it. Sometimes I'm just like, girl, I'm I done. can't do this anymore. Um, we need to switch it up. Um, and so that's one thing with that. And then the band has honestly been, I mean, music has always been a, such an important part of my life. Um, and I think that similar to art, like I, I always wanted to be a poet and a painter um, growing up, and I never thought of myself as wanting to be a musician, but music was just such a part of my life growing up and my family's life and the religious life. I grew up super, super, super um, religious from a very, um, from a, a Southern Baptist background. We were in church like five days a week, but so much of that was music focused. So part of it was just like dogmatic, like scary, kind of like you're gonna burn in hell if you don't follow these, these like kind of somewhat inconsistent rules. But um, there was also a lot of just like ec ecstasy and really like sublimity that I found in music. And so, but all of these things that I grew up really close to, I found when I went to these kind of like bougie liberal arts art school with like a bunch of rich kids that went to private schools was really, really frustrating. And I felt alienated from the discourse that was attached to all of the art forms that I found myself so in love with. Poetry, I at least could approach from the perspective of studying it. You know, I, I was able to see a, a kind of humanities, uh, literature, literary theory as more almost meritocratic, whereas art just felt like, I'm like, what? You're like 19 years old and you feel comfortable just sticking a dot on a wall? Like, this is really insane to me. Like, shouldn't someone be telling me how to paint or draw? Like, I, this is really insane. And so I really distanced myself from those things and I found my way back to them through other means. And so DJing was one way that I found myself back at music, but with Joe, um, who's also in, who's the other, the third member of the band, um, 
through, per through performance art. And so I started doing performance art just because it was practical, I had no money. It's just like, how do we, how do we take all of these sensibilities, feelings, ideas, and put them in a venue in a way that doesn't require a studio, a lot of resources, et cetera. And so through that, it ultimately became about, about music. And I don't know if maybe subconsciously that's what was driving it the whole time, but um, both the, like now it's just like, we're just making music, you know, I'm, I'm singing, producing in the band. And so now it just is the thing, but it's been a really long process. It's been now like almost 10 years from doing performance art to now just being like, okay, we're just doing music. Um, and I think similarly with the art making process for so long, I felt uh, almost like, like I have to do it myself. It's just like opening up this process to other people is anxiety ridden. You know, I'm a really neurotic person and, some, and with art making, especially when you're in the art, you, it can be so charged. And so, but f slowly starting to free myself of being like, I have to do everything and opening up the process to other people has also allowed me to just experience joy in the process of art making. And so I feel like, both with the band and with um, the new work. Um, not that I'm not having fun shooting myself. I don't want to say that it's just like slavery, but it's, 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 it's not the same as being able to shoot other people and just approach it with that without the need of like, oh my God, I should have done this. Um, and so the band is like... Um, what's the sound? Like, like, what's the vibe? The sound is all sorts of things because we're all, like, constantly absorbing references. I would say there's some post-punk, there's some, like, goth sensibilities. Uh, Dylan and I love Christian Death. Um, that's, like, one of our, um, like, our favorite bands, so it's like Boss religious, Williams. It's, like, religious, like, heavy there's metal music. There's some religious references. It's, like, metal, a little bit of post-punk, but also, like... Um, influences from dance, because we all love to dance. We all are also involved in dance music in various capacities. Um, and so the, the title song and the, and the video that's in the show is called Pretty Canary. And it's sort of uh, like, it's a song that started off as an experiment in my bedroom. I had to do this live stream for a, a digital residency that was happening um, in the end of 2020, I think, or uh, the no, the summer of 2020. And it just started off, like, it was one of these things that kind of just came out. Like, I don't even know just came to where, the, like, where the words came from. Like, sometimes it's kind of like pulling teeth. Songwriting can be a really overwrought process that's really laborious. And it's like, wait, like, what do I rhyme with this word that I've now committed to? I don't know. And it takes three days just to come up with. But this, the beginning of the song really just came out in this almost kind of magical way. It was one of these moments where I'm like, oh, I wish all art making was like this. Everything would be so easy. Um, and then the song really evolved like over time where it's like, then I met with Joe and Joe expanded it with guitars and then we added more production and it, and it really is like a, such a reflection of like uh, poetry, my relationship to writing, experimenting with vocal techniques. Uh, Joe is both like a kind of like, he, he came up in a sort of like heavy metal and punk context, but then is also a chamber music composer. Dylan is like a synth kind of like mastermind. And so we all come together. It's a very big sound, um, but yeah. I think it's really inspiring to have you basically create these pockets of community within an art practice because it can be really lonely to produce work on your own. And I think there's oftentimes this expectation of like the genius artists locked away in their studio making something and then it's just all them and like it's their name. But that gets really isolating and really lonely. And I, I think also it's like in order to work with other people, you do have to trust them and you have to believe that what you can make in as a group is much um, deeper or much bigger than what you can make by yourself. So I'm very excited to watch the um, official music video. I saw some clips before that Dylan showed me like little, yeah, yeah it, I'm like, I'm, I'm vibing with the, the with, yeah. There's also some, um, so I did the, we worked with an animator, a really amazing animator, but I drew the actual canary itself. So the canary is like. Um, On the guitarist's face. 
Um, so no, so the, I also painted Joe's face as the canary, but there's, there's a cartoon, kind of like, almost like an old Disney cartoon version of the canary itself um, that I did the drawing references for. So it, it is, it does feel like an extension of the visual, interspecies visual world. Although the, the species are distinct in the music video. It's like canaries and humans. It's not, like there's not, not a they're hybrid. Not, they're, they're not hybrids, okay. Yeah. Um, one thing that I was curious about is I know that you have like a very deep appreciation for technology and like cyberspace, Tumblr, and I, I'm just curious to like what your relationship is to perhaps like cyborgian philosophies or if there's like ever a potential to delve more into the more like t technological realm with these characters. And if not, just like what, like your own feelings about how technology um, affects our desires and just post-human discourses in general related to technology, yeah. Um, I think that I have always had a deep interest in technology. I love technology um, in the sense that, like, so both of, both of my parents growing up were um, engineers and they both had a really strong belief in technology as basically the kind of, um, launch pad for, for upward mobility for black people and even to the level of just like that, that if we can give technological tools to black people that that would be a means to liberation. And so technology and the ideas surrounding technology were really gilded um, with my family growing up. And so I always had a fascination and was encouraged from a very young age to um, digitize anything that I did. And so, um, like I wanted to be a painter and my mom was like, okay, painting is cool, but like, well, can you do this on a computer? And she would always, anything I was interested in, okay, like music is cool, but like, what can you, can you do it on a computer? And she would, you know, in, in a way that, even though my mom is like quite conservative in a lot of ways, she was really encouraging with technology. So we had Photoshop really early on, even just like when I was three, I would make like Microsoft paint paintings it's just like really pixelated but um i'm really happy that there was this constant encouragement to think through technology and to encourage um experimentation through technology um and so that's always been a part of how i approach things but then i have found myself frustrated recently i'm sure as most people have i think that the transition to um mobile technology and like social media and the phone as the kind of like primary interface for technological advancement and that most technological advancement would be directed towards um, innovations related to how you ultimately like sit on your phone is really scary. It's yeah, and it's just like it's just not and it's just not inspiring. Even the transition from desktop to mobile was really sad to me because I think that even something like a kind of blog approach to the interface, the user interface of technology is so different than an app, um, even if the app is independently developed or something like that. And so I think part of the joy of the process of the art that I'm making now is art as a different interface for technology. And so it's like, I am still deeply invested in the process of printing and digitizing aesthetics and understanding how I can use uh, software and printing and molding technologies to um, express my ideas. But I think that I'm really thankful and grateful to have visual art as a platform for where, where that expresses itself. Because I don't think that I would find myself satiated if my ultimate platform was just within a kind of app on a phone or something like that. Versus before, blogging, I did find myself satiated by the actual experience of producing work for that context. And so even like what you were saying earlier about the kind of if you look at the, the photo of the image, I really take joy in the fact that I, there's a different relationship to the art that you see. It's not one that's less digital. Like, I don't like the idea that it's like, get offline and go see the art. It's like, this is a reflection of a very, a hyper online person, but the art itself is the interface. And it's a reflection of the different technological tools that go into the 
that process. Yeah, and I think just it was also a reminder for me that as much as, of course, I have Instagram and I follow art, different artists and I like to see the work online, there's a different experience that you ha- that I had seeing these works in, in person for the first time. Like It wasn't like it was trying to denounce the digital space, but I think it's it's one of those things where sometimes you just have to experience the, not even like in-person reality of an artwork, but also like the long form aspect of it. And I find that with Instagram and just like social media, sometimes there's a pressure to, that's artists inevitably face where like subconsciously they're having to format what they're doing to make sense on that interface, which is something that worries me. And I'm sure it worries a lot of different artists, but I think there's also a lot of good that comes from the the connectivity that comes from the app. So what can we do? Um, I'm also curious to know about just what it's like for you to work in different cities. I know that you produce a lot of the work for the show in Berlin. I know that you've called Berlin a second home for quite some time and that you're also working in New York. Um, but yeah, I'm just, I'm curious to know like just how has Berlin affected the way that you make work, the acceleration of how you make work um, and how you balance between all of these different um, localities. And, and also, I mean, you're working in so many different uh, fields and I think there is something to be said about this kind of turn away from becoming a master at one thing you know I think there is something beautiful about sticking to like one thing and just like being a painter and doing that but I can also admit like I work in other in different mediums I write I do performance and I think there's a courage that you also have to have to be able to turn away from something when you're tired of it instead of like continuing to do the same thing over and over and over again Um, So I guess I'm kind of curious also to know how your interdisciplinarity kind of feeds into your movements in different cities and your art practice. Yeah, and also just like why Berlin speaks to you. Um, I sort of have a, with, I mean, I guess it's only only three cities in my life that I've ever felt this way about. There's one other city, but I haven't actually spent any time there yet. But um, I sort of just have a feeling where it's like, if I go somewhere and I feel a connection there, I then I'm like, okay, I'm gonna commit some time to this place, see if this is like, kind of follow this inclination and then just explore it. And the first thing that really attracted me about Berlin was just the space. I just loved, like, the. I went straight from the airport to, like, a park, and I was like, oh, my God, there's so many parks, and you can just sit down, and you don't have to pay for it. You don't have to pay for anything. Like, you you can sit at a cafe and just get, like, a tea, and no one's, like, screaming at me or, like, glaring at me um, for not buying something else. And so I think the relationship to space and time in the city was really the first thing that really wowed me and and was so... um, it enabled and lubricated a different way of like imagining oneself, imagining your relationship to others. And so even like sociality here, I think is quite different. There's so much time that I can afford to uh, social rituals with people that I love. I can very quickly meet someone, be curious about that person, and follow that into just so much time spent together. And it doesn't require like scheduling and calendaring and interfacing in in that way. And so I would say that both space and time feel a little bit more liquid, at least in comparison to a place like New York where those two things are like the limited resources where you're like, what, like two weeks disappeared already? How did this happen? In a way that can sometimes be kind of like cruel to at least the imagination, Um, I think, even New York is a city that that kind of can function in a way that's parallel to something like the fashion industry, where it's like, fashion is so interesting to me because I'm like, it's, it's a, it is an art form, but it's an art form that's on such a rigid schedule. It's like, you have to produce things on a quarterly schedule every year or else you're not considered even in the running to be recognized as doing the thing. And I think that that's really kind of like an analog for the city as a whole in certain cities. Um, and so, yeah, and so when I came here, I just, I, I was fascinated by that. I love the history in Berlin. Um, I'm obsessed with Weimar Berlin. It's just like so cool that the way that the, the history of the city 
in the sense that countercultures and quite weird and very like queer versions of sociality emerge from really kind of like austere, like aus what austerity can produce as a culture that is like simultaneously ref reflection of that, but also so lush and pleasure focused in a way that is really wonderful and cool to me. Um, I also like that people are committed to the bit of insisting that um, like uh, time and space are resources that everyone should have access to. Um, and even in the way that the city codifies certain laws um, is, is, is interesting in that way. Um, but I think that moving to different cities and being maybe even as a reflection of like the different aspects of what I do is, is like, I mean, there's, there's different relationships to it. One is just like, I'm the descendant of people that were um, literally like, their movement was restricted. Um, my grandparents couldn't read. Um, and so I don't know why I'm getting a little bit emotional, but um, my grandparents couldn't read and couldn't travel. And it means a lot to me to be able to move through the world. And I think about, I was actually watching this like James Baldwin interview earlier where he's like, it took so long for me to realize that I have a right to be here. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think that's one of the main reasons. I think about that a lot. Sometimes when I'm like frustrated and overwhelmed and stressed out, cause I, I do a lot of things and like, like the last two weeks, it's like every single deadline that I have is all uh -huh. together. It's like the manuscript for my next book, finishing a show, the EP, we're finishing. Everything is all literally in the exact two week time span and I was, um, also traveling this weekend and we played a gig with the band and I was like on the plane and I was so stressed out. And then I, um, I had watched that James Baldwin interview in the hotel and I was like, actually, you know what? Everything's fine. And not only do I have a right to be here, but I'm, I'm really happy to take up that opportunity. And it's like, if I'm gonna do, if I want to do something, I'm gonna do it. Um, and it's really important to me um, as the descendant of the people that I came from to do that but also just like as a way to enrich the imagination. It's really rare and I feel so lucky to have that opportunity and sometimes there's a lot of like sacrifice. Like I, some people really value having like a savings account and like, I don't know, being an adult in that specific way. I don't value that. It's just not my thing. Um, free, like freedom and freedom of movement. Um, is really important to me. And so I think that is that relates to all of those practices, but it also is really enriching and it makes, uh, it makes for a really vibrant life. And all of the things that I do, I see as interconnected. They don't feel like, it's not like now I'm doing music, now I'm doing this other thing. And as I age, um, it becomes more so the case and they all become uh, even more interconnected, yeah. I think it's um, very important that, you know, as black people, we understand that the, I mean, I, I also travel and I have this life and it can get very hard sometimes. It can feel really isolating and really frustrating. I think about all of the labor and all of the energy and all of the suffering, honestly, that has gone into me being able to live the life that I live. And I'm, I, I'm in gratitude for that, but I also think it's important to have this like, oh, but sometimes shit gets fucked. And like, we can also be like, wait a minute. Like, I need to take, let's take a beat, you know? Yeah. Like, it, it's like a balancing act of like, oh no, I'm like really, I'm grateful for this life. And so it's one of those like ever, we're just always having to kind of be on that tightrope of just trying to figure out when it's important for us to just keep per persevering and when it's time to like be like, okay, I actually need to like, um, but I think it's really beautiful that you, that you think about your grandparents in this way. And I think obviously like they're living within you and through you and all of the, the wisdom and, and knowledge that you're acquiring in all of your pursuits is also kind of being, like they're also feeding off of that too, which is such a beautiful- For sure. Yeah. I think about my grandfather a lot. Word. Um, I think maybe this is, I'm just like, I'm like so overwhelmed, <laughs> sorry. Um, I think maybe now we could open it up to the audience um, to ask any questions. Thank you so much for your presence and your, just your energy. I just think that you're a phenomenal, ph phenomenal person. Thank and you I'm, for doing this. Yeah, of course. 
Okay, so you're here. And also one last thing, like, it's just like so surreal. Like, I remember going to, like I was going to school at the time, and I know that you have like, very mixed feelings about this sculpture that was in the, the new museum and just the show in general, but I remember like seeing your work for the first time when I was in college and just being so like, finally, like, let's fucking, like, let's do this. And it's just, I am it's a really special moment for me and I'm just so grateful and you're just such a lovely person. And okay, let's, okay, let's just bring it to the audience. But yeah, just thank you for sharing space with me. So my question is, as you've come into your success and your abundance, how have you registered or like sat with accepting that like this is where you are now, like this is your position and like how, do you allow yourself to enjoy it or are you constantly on the go to the next move? That's a question. Um, I mean, I think there's always... For years, I had imposter syndrome, and I don't have that anymore. I don't feel like it's, it's, it's imposter syndrome, but I always feel like, I'm like, is this the thing? Is this the thing? Is that the... Um... But I, at the end of the day, I just, I feel really lucky and satiated that I get to do what I do, um, and I... Uh, yeah, it's it's hard because sometimes being an artist, there's not really a distinction between the things that bring you pleasure and the things that bring you respite or rest. And so sometimes that can get um, intense in the sense that there's just like a lot that's going. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely take time to, for myself at a certain point, like I think that I'm happy that a nightlife was such a part of what I do because it's like, I know how to party. Um, and so there are definitely, um, like after, on Friday, I'm going to New York and I will definitely be enjoying myself um, for a period of time because it's been a lot of work, um, but yeah. Juliana, I'm really curious, like you said, when you were a kid, you really wanted to be a poet. And I'm curious what poetry was lighting you up when you were like 10, 11, 12, 13 years old. And if you remember any poets' poems or maybe like, yeah. I mean, growing up, like Psalms was kind of like the most exalted poetry in my family. Um, and like my grandfather would just like randomly recite passages from Psalms. And for, uh, you know, I kind of had my like, I hate religion, I'm an atheist for years and just rejected all of that. But I think Psalms is really beautiful. Um, but then also I think the what animated me and what drew me to poetry, yeah, was just the sort of like uh, black American sort of like religious tradition in terms of just like oration and the relationship between like poetry and music and kind of um, igniting ecstatic states through language was really an important part of my life. Then when I got into um, actual, um, more into actual poetry, Nikki Giovanni was my favorite poet. Um, was my favorite poet growing up. Uh, by the time I got to high school, we had, there was like a, a state competition called Poetry Interp, where you would just competitively read poetry. I'd, um, and I would always read Nikki Giovanni uh, poems because I loved her. So firstly, thank you both of you for the absolutely moving and beautiful conversation. I think uh, the first question intuitively is about the title and the subtitle specifically for you, Juliana, but of course, Monilona, if you have some reflections as well. So what is your relation to both? How do you um, coalesce with the imagination and the unknown? Um, I mean, the imagination is, I mean, for me, maybe my favorite thing about I'm like, my favorite thing about being alive, that sounds really absurd to say that now, but it does feel that way sometimes. I'm endlessly just like um, dumbfounded by 
how much there is to explore. Um, for me, there's a direct relationship between, like my, I have the type of imagination that really has to be fed. And so there's part of it that's like, yes, just like images that you can conjure, or maybe you keep a dream journal and you just kind of like have, you know, some people, I think it's almost like a, a mystic state where it's like, the imagination is this untouchable well that you just access maybe through certain rituals or art is the ritual through which you access your imagination. Um, but for me, I really love research and the imagination kind of go hand in hand. And there's really a curiosity that I hope to approach the world with that really fuels so much of what I do to understand more, to learn more, to expand even in language, the kind of like references that you can use to express an idea um, is so exciting to me. And so um, what brings me a lot of sustenance creatively is, is, is feeding, feeding the imagination through um, reading um, and through a lot of uh, research is really um, even just like history, knowing more about the historical context in which an aesthetic emerges or thinking like, okay, this is something that I'm interested in or this is something that I want to explore and then backtracking from that and wanting to understand like what's maybe at work. And so like oftentimes the unknown is like, like I'm interacting with something as just like a sign that is interesting to me, that strikes me, that motivates me. Like what are the conditions in which this sign arrived to me and what is the history of that sign itself? And so much of uh, my fascination with subcultures especially and the kind of movements of subcultures and the history of subcultures is that it really gives, you can, you can kind of glean into like what allowed those signs to be there in the first place. And so our idea of even counterculture, how is that framed? What's the racial history of like early punk or something like that? And then the joy and understanding more and learning more about that historical context then it excites and animates um, the sort of play that I feel in working with it later on. Um, I would say that for me, the unknown is, uh, it's a material like to work with. I think so much of the political, uh, like just chaos, the violence, uh, the conflict that we're seeing in like unfold in society is about this fear of the unknown particularly like in the unknown, in the unknown of the other. Um, and I think that as humans, there's also a lot that we're having to contend with, which is waking up every single day and not really knowing what's gonna happen. We, we kind of pretend, we have these routines and schedules and we, we feel like some semblance of, of control through them, but, but we don't really know what's going to happen or how long we'll be here. And I found that for me, art has just been a way for me to therapeutically move through that at times like difficult reality of just not being able to control things, people, outcomes, um, sitting with the discomfort of that. Um, and also like with, with making an artwork, you oftentimes like don't know where you're gonna end up, you know? like. And I think there's something to be said about also facing the potential of like, quote unquote, failure or success in making something that you may or may not share with other people. And I think, yeah, just in general, art making producing art is a, is a meditation for me, a way of sitting with that reality that is always present as much as we want to push it away and pretend like it doesn't exist. Um, and I think artists are really, it's, I mean, sometimes we can get a bit too close to like the the sun and it can get kind of scary um, if you go too far down the hole. But I think that artists are really courageous in general for kind of creating an entire life around this uh, this hole. Like, or I just find it crazy how artists, like literally like, like the, our jobs are just like following our creativity and we just like half the time are like, what's going on in there? Like what's going on at the, like, but then you're, you built an entire life around that, this like thing that, is always kind of like shifting and like moving all about. Um, it's crazy, like being an artist under capitalism. But anyway, so, but yeah, I just for, I would say like fundamentally, it's a way to it's a, art art producing art production is like a very, a very therapeutic means to make um, peace with this reality of the unknown.
So thank you so much. I'm really glad to be here. And uh, I have a question for both of you. Um, if you could be an element, what element you could be? Uh, because I deeply thought, I deeply think like artists in different practice, they have a sort of muscular memory about how our story and many, many story, they come back to something extremely present and visible as a piece of art or people's stories. So based on muscular memory, which kind of element feel you or you feel close? I need a second to think, but I'm thinking immediately about Avatar and The Last Air Airbender. And I was like, would I be like in the fire team? Like, I don't know which one I would be. I mean, this is a hard question. <laughs> do, you have, do you know what you would be? I would be Could mucus be more or, than one, by the way. Mucus or slime. <laughs> mucus or slime. Like a slime mold or, or snot <laughs> or like pus or something like that. Something jiggly and like not quite solid, not quite liquid. Yeah. <laughs> Elastic. Elastic. Yeah, if I haven't answered that, that will follow that. That's can we, like. Can we hear the whys? <laughs> the whys. The, the whys. Um, I like to jiggle. Um, I also like to be wet, but not a liquid. Um, I feel like being a liquid would be exhausting at a certain point. Solids are boring, at least to me. Like, um, and also, like, I think slime molds are really cool and they have really advanced intelligence. And so you can be intelligent and also in that sort of gelatinous state. Mm. <laughs> I can't follow that up. I, Hold I, on, no, you can't, Moni. I, 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 I have no. You answer. could definitely, come on. I mean, you just like talk shit more about than one, one of the ones that I was thinking about. Just for a second, not forever. I feel like it's like so easy because I'm a Libra, but I thought air. Oh. Windy, you're windy. Air. What does that mean? I'm windy. What does that mean? You're translucent. You flow. Oh, you okay. Flow. You move in a room. Okay, I'll take I'll take that explanation. But yeah, I feel like my head is like very in the clouds, and I think that there's something I find to be really interesting about how air is kind of the thing that keeps us alive, and it's very ever present but also like very invisible it's like everywhere um but mucus is also like a good a good answer i don't know they should have like a reboot of the show and then they have like the mucus people like as a part of the <laughs> yeah first of all i'm extremely happy that i get introduced to both of your works um i'm extremely happy to be here and second of all i was thinking jana um, you're doing music, you write, you do performative art. Is there any film work in your future? Because like, it sounds like you're capable of all of this with the technology like that it's in your mind and in your work and in your brain. Like You would be suited for this, so I'm just interested in this. So I'm, I'm, okay, I have a complicated relationship to film. So part of my really religious upbringing is that we weren't, allowed to watch television or watch secular movies for most of my childhood. And so while I'm fascinated by film and cinema, it's not the place that my brain goes to as a default. I think like, I do think that childhood affects your imagination in, in, in the sense that, you know, when you're a child, you're expanding like what you process the world through. And so much of mine was not, um, film-based or cinema-based, but I do find cinema really fascinating. And some of my favorite like um, works of art are films. I think for me, because, okay, I have so much respect for film directors because to me, it's like you have to have a creative mind, but simultaneously you have to have an admin mind. And I am administratively challenged, and so, the idea of having to like think of a, an, a scene or an image in f 10 people being coordinated is so stressful to me. And I just, I'm like, maybe that will be the sign that I'm like a fully an adult when I can do something like that. Like I, I've, I've even writ written notes um, where it's like, oh, this would be a really cool, even just like a short, short film or something. And I mean, I've done videos. I've done videos before and I did make one with a friend. I made one short film, but we basically worked with a team that 
that translated because both uh, it was my friend Hannah and I, and both of us are administratively challenged. And so they essentially like took on that labor for us. And it was a great experience, but I feel like I need to develop my admin brain more um, to do that because fi film directors, it's like they think in both simultaneously, which is so crazy to me, but also really cool. Thank you so much for the very interesting conversation and also for bringing so much fun and love laughter into the room. I was wondering, because you said you have three favorite cities or cities where you feel like you belong to, and one is, I assume, New York and Berlin, and also an additional one that you haven't been to. What are the other two, and maybe why? Um, Beirut is the other, is the third city that I love. Um, and I lived there for like eight months, and it's a city that's difficult to make working the way that I do with all the traveling um, super feasible. Um, but I go back whenever I can. Like I'm in the winter, I'm going back for a month or two back to Beirut. Um, but that is a city that I love so much because it's it's a very intense city. It's a city that's always enduring a lot. There's like economic crisis, political crisis, but there's such a like rich sense of cosmopolitanism that's also really specific to that region, but it's so warm and it's so beautiful and it's the music is so intense. And as a city that's been under so much duress for so long, there's a headiness that people approach, um, especially the kind of artistic culture there. And so like I, I, I don't come, come to music as like escapism. Art in general is not escapism to me. It's kind of a reflection of maybe where I'm at or where the world is at or something, but I don't idealize art as an escape. And so much, so many of my friends, so much of the music and artists that I love and feel like I'm in community with there are, um, it's very, it's very heady, um, but also kind of, um, I don't know, a reflection of the energy of the city. Um, I think it's like, maybe problematic to say that cities that are going through as much as Beirut is to be like, oh, it's about tenacity. Like, I don't know if it is about tenacity because a lot of people just leave, but um, I feel, I came to that city in a really difficult place in my life and was so enriched by the people there and the music there and my friends there. And it's such a beautiful city. Um, and I think that there's something that I can relate to about Beirut from, from the kind of like, uh, the sort of like pain and the duress of like where I come from and where my family comes from. And so there's something about the city that feels almost kind of sublime at my favorite moments there. Um, the other city, which I've only been to once, um, is Sao Paulo. Yeah. Thank you, ladies. That was awesome. Um, may I ask you when you were, when you came actually the first time to Berlin and why? What was the reason? Okay, I'll go. Um, so I went to NYU, and if people don't know about this school, it's like one of the, it's a very expensive school, and I had scholarships. Um, otherwise, I would not have been able to afford to like live in New York or to, f to pursue that degree. And um, in 2016, I studied abroad in Berlin for six months, having no like real preconceptions about the city other than my college credits are here. I have to go here. My friends are there. There's parties. Let's go. Um, but then when I went, I found that there was, a, we said it before, but there was like a spaciousness and not even in terms of just the geography, but I kind of appreciated having this distance from um, the discourses that were expected of black queer artists in New York at that time. I felt that it. I just like had a moment to be like, wait, what do I actually like? think about art and like what do I want to make art about and just I, I found that having like a physical space was an, important to me at that time in my life um, and yeah when I graduated I didn't have any more money and I just I still to, the, to this day don't understand how people like live in New York I love New York so much but it's just so expensive and um, I just knew that it wasn't going to be like feasible for me to like 
figure out like the beginning stages of my art career there. And I also loved Berlin so much. And so yeah, I, I moved, I did this artist residency in Maine and then I packed up all of my stuff at this residency at two suitcases. And then I just moved to Berlin at 21 alone and just figured it out. Um, you also mentioned that performance was the only, like for there, there was a time in your life where that was all that you had access to. And I really relate to that because I didn't have money, I didn't have a studio, but I had friends that were doing these like these little performances here and there and just saying, hey, like, do you wanna do this thing? It's donation based, so it's like not paid, but just, you know, express yourself. And so I found that I was able to just begin to explore the, my artistic practice and I wasn't doing that much performance in New York. Um, so, so yeah, I think just Berlin, I, it was a financial choice to be honest, like it, that was a big part of it, but I also appreciated the like artistic discourses that were happening here and the music and just, just meeting all these different people from all over the place. Um, and it's been five years now and I'm kind of, I don't know, I'm like in this like moment of like, what's next? I don't know. It's, I think five, there's like this thing that happens when you've lived somewhere for five years where you're like, am I still happy here? Like, do I still want to be here? And I think I'm trying to remember that a city is not, like moving somewhere else is not going to magically like evaporate all of my problems, you know? And there's a lot that Berlin still does give me. Um, but of course I miss New York. Of course I miss my family who live in the East Coast. Like I, I just, there's a lot that I miss about being in America, but also just the longer I'm out of it, I'm like, ah, it's like, it's just, it's, it's really, it's really hectic, it's really hard. And it's, I hate feeling this like estrangement that is like not entirely my choice sometimes with it. But then I also definitely feel estranged living in Germany too, because we forget Berlin is in Germany, you know, like it's still Germany and I'm like, I'm not German, like I'm so, like I'm just not, you know? And and so, yeah, I'm, I'm in this like moment right now, I don't know what's next. Like, do I go to grad school? Do I do a residency? Do I do something just to, like have some space? Um, but Berlin has given me so much like in the last five years and I'm, I think I made the right choice like moving here. I think I've met a lot of amazing people and I've made a lot of work and yeah. That's you. Um, I I came to New I came to Berlin in a different and and so I I was living the first time I came here was 2013 and I was living in New York and I had uh, you know a really good out of college job I was working for this like public interest law firm um, that was like a really stressful job. It looked great on the books and everyone was like, wow, you have a good job. And I was like so miserable. And I, my last like year and a half, I just like never left. I was on such an extreme budget. I was like, I'm gonna just like save up enough money to quit this job. And I just need to know that I have enough for like six months of my life taken care of and also to like leave and go somewhere. And I had met so many people um, that lived in, uh, lived in Berlin that had come to New York or would do like an artist residency or something. And Berlin turned into one of these cities where people were like, oh, you've never been to Berlin. I can't believe you've never been to Berlin. And it just like turned into this thing where I was like, I was almost just like so annoyed. I was like curious, but also annoyed because it was this constant thing of people presuming that I had been there. And so I quit my day job and I went, I came to Berlin in like June of 2013 um, and I stayed for six weeks. And I was so obsessed with the city for so many, so many different reasons. I also already had a lot of friends that lived here, um, but I really just felt kind of like embraced by the city. And what I loved about it, which was so different from, at least at the time, the life that I was living in New York, was that there was so much space for eccentricity and there were people that were living highly functional lives, but were like, like really, really weird, bizarre people. And I was like, oh wow, me too. But like, I'm like weirdly at this lawyer day job having an emotional breakdown every day. And so it was, so refreshing to be in community with just like 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 eccentrics um and 
also a lot of eccentrics that spanned a, a, a wide age range. And so one thing about New York is that because it's such a work culture, there's a lot of like people turn like 29 and they're like, oh, I can't go out anymore. Like it's not working for my skin. And I'm like, you're 28. Like, what are you talking about? And I loved that coming here. Like there was none of that. It was just like the freaks are out. <laughs> We're having a good time. You're 63. <laughs> you're at the club. Me too. Um, <laughs> And so I didn't move here then, but then I, I, that was when I started kind of my coming to Berlin. So at first it would be like, oh, I'll come for a month or two in the summer. Um, and then, in, and so I was here a lot, usually around the summer. Um, and then I would pop out once or twice, maybe at different other times in the year. And in 2018, I just decided, okay, I'm going to just do the thing. Um, and commit to living here. And since then, I've spent probably most of my time in Berlin, with the exception of the one year that I um, spent eight months in Beirut. I've spent most of my time here. Um, and I still, all of the things that I originally loved about Berlin, um, I still am so drawn to it, um, especially just as a space where, like, um, eccentricity has space to just like flourish um, and people that are living uncon unconventional lives, difficult lives, lives that aren't easily uh, monetized in a kind of like media spectacle, uh, self-branding economy um, are really able to just do their thing. Obviously that's clearly placed under duress uh, for a lot of reasons and like so many cities there's just the general like sweeping away of like protections for housing etc cetera, etc cetera. but um, it's, it still has so much of that charm for me. Um, yeah, and any time that I, Berlin gets to be too much, I also live in New York too. So it's like, for me, like the bounce between the two is just like kind of perfect. Um, and I'm really happy living between the two. Thank you so much, Juliana, for, for being here. Thank you for, oh my God. Thank you, Juliana. Thank you, Monilova, for this very inspiring conversation. I think it was a great opportunity to learn about your artistic practice more, Juliana. Um, I would like to invite you to take a look at our exhibitions. Our exhibition hall will be open until 10 p.m. today. Uh, we look forward to see you with this Thursday. We are still in process of installation, but you will have the opportunity to have a preview. Thank you all for coming and enjoy the rest of your evening.